started off tonight. So the Chicopee Public Library has received a CARES Act grant during this COVID time. And the Institute of Museum and Library Services have given us money to do distance learning. And the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners is who distributes the money to us. So during the last few months, the Chicopee Library has been sharing programs related to Polish history and culture. And this is one of the talks that relates to Polish history. So we're thrilled that we can have Dr. Dabrowski with us today to give us this talk. We are collaborating with some local people from the Polish Genealogical Society of Massachusetts and the Polish Heritage Society in Northampton and Chicopee TV and Bernat's Deli, the Polish Center of Discovery and Learning and some other places that are local to us here. So if you live in the area and you want to check out any of those things, you can do that. So today we're having Dr. Patrice Dabrowski give us a talk on the history of Poland. And she is a historian with a degree from Harvard University in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. She has taught and or worked at Harvard, Brown, the University of Vienna, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She is currently an associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, a member of the board of directors of the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America, and the editor of H. Poland. She is the author of three books, Poland the First Thousand Years, which is what this talk is based on, Commemorations in the Shaping of Modern Poland, and The Carpathians Discovering the Highlands of Poland and Ukraine, which is coming out this fall. In 2014, she was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Order of the Merit of the Republic of Poland. So during this talk today, she's going to cover the information that's in her book, Poland the First Thousand Years. So if you enjoy the talk, you may want to check the book out from your library. If you have questions during the talk, there's a chat function. You can type your questions right in the chat. And while Dr. Dorowski is talking, we're gonna ask that you have your mute selected so that we don't hear other distracting sounds during the talk. And since this is a grant, we would love it if you posted your comments that you're thinking as you're listening to the talk. If you hear something that you think is especially surprising, if you have a part of the talk that you're really enjoying, we'd love to hear it. So just pop it in the chat when you're thinking these things and we'd love to have that. So right now, we're gonna turn the time over to Dr. Dorowski and get started. Well, thank you for that kind introduction and for the invitation to participate in this wonderful project. Uh, uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. And I'm very pleased to be able to present to all of you here today, a brief survey of over a thousand years of Polish history. Now let's see if I can get my screen shared here. Here we go. Very good. So let us begin. That little is commonly known about Poland is not because the Polish past is uninteresting or uneventful. That is hardly the case. Still, history has not always been kind to Poland, a country located right in the heart of the European continent. The history of Poland and the Poles has been marked by twists and turns, even ruptures. Today, we will survey that history in broad outline. Among other things, we will consider such fundamental questions as, what Poland and what Poles? Let me try to explain. The action of Alfred Jarry's outrageously offensive 1896 play, Ubu Roi, or King Ubu, reportedly took place nowhere that is Poland. Nowhere could indeed be Poland's location but it was far from the only location. The thousand plus year old country we call Poland has been a moving target. 
Let's preview the history we'll cover today with the help of a series of maps done to scale. This is how Poland is situated today. It is one of the larger European countries in a sea of nation states. If we go back a millennium, we have the early medieval state. On this map, it does resemble the present day polity in both size and location. But jump forward to the 14th century, or here on this map, the 16th, this much larger pink entity extending across Central and Eastern Europe is the late medieval and early modern permutation of Poland. Most people have no idea that so much of the region had once been under Polish control. Why might that be the case? Fast forward several centuries and we have no Poland at all. The state makes a new appearance after World War I, and this is what it looked like. Somewhat smaller than in the early modern period, but still significant. Out of the ashes of World War II, which was an unmitigated disaster for the Poles, a period again when there was no Polish state, here comes a new incarnation of Poland a Poland in pretty much the borders we see today and to which we return. The upshot of all this, there simply is no single piece of territory that has been part of a Polish state throughout the country's entire history. Nor for that matter, has the definition of who is a Pole been constant, something I'll talk about later. These are some of the reasons why Polish history is not your average national history, if there were such a thing. So what are the most important things to know about Polish history? Let's start with its historical beginnings. At what point does something resembling Poland appear in historical sources? The Jewish traveler and merchant from Cordoba, Ibrahim Ibn Yaqub, who traveled through this region of Europe in the years 965 and 966, left the first account of the state of Mieszko. For those of you who know ancient or medieval history, 966 can seem rather late to begin that is relative to the west or south of Europe. But we historians have precious little to work with early on in the case of the beginnings of Polish statehood. The Roman Empire never extended to these northern plains and thus Romans left no records of any early history of the people we label Poles or the country we refer to as Poland. From what we have been able to deduce from the available sources, a dynamic new state burst onto the scene in the region of what is now Gniezno and Poznań in the 10th century. It showed signs of being a functioning state, wealthy and with a strong, organized, well-financed army and a leader, Mieszko, whom Ibrahim Ibn Yaqub labeled a king although later sources call him a duke. As it turns out, at precisely this time, the young state entered into relations with the Western world. The pagan Mieszko married the Czech princess Dubravka and was baptized into the Church of Rome. This move would have great repercussions for Poland, meaning that it was pulled in the direction of the West. The first crowned monarch was Mieszko's son Bolesław, and it was under his reign that the term Polonia was first used in reference to this state. So around the year 1000, we can speak of Poland. 
With the Christianization of the Polish court and ultimately the Polish population came an influx of outsiders, in particular the Germans and Czechs who staffed the young church. So from the very outset, one would be hard pressed to speak of an ethnically homogeneous state. Although these concepts were utterly foreign, not to say anachronistic. The important divisions were estate-based. One's occupational status as a warrior, a clergyman, a burgher, or a villager was what determined one's identity. Now, Christianization had its ups and downs in the next several centuries, but finally took hold. The same can be said of the state. There was a period of so-called feudal disintegration when the sons of the king divvied up the country among themselves. A reassembling of the Polish lands took place under two noteworthy 14th century rulers. The puny but persistent Władysław Wokietek, called the Elbow High, and his son Kazimierz. The latter would go down in history as Kazimierz the Great, the only Polish king to receive such a moniker. The town of Kraków became capital of Poland. Kazimierz also founded the first university in 1364. Although Kazimierz had already gained control over some new territories in the East, another significant event would result in Poland's attention truly turning eastward. This was the royal marriage of Kazimierz's grandniece Jadwiga to the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Jagiełło, known as Jogaila in Lithuanian. Far from the tiny entity it is today, the Lithuania of the 14th century was a huge state comprising much of today's Belarus and Ukraine, parts of Russia, as well as Lithuania proper. That personal union of the two states immediately raised Poland-Lithuania to the status of a major European country, one that needed to be taken seriously. It was the largest polity in continental Europe. Of no less importance, Poland baptized into the Church of Rome became the baptizer of pagan Lithuania, in this way bringing it into the Western orbit. Under the descendants of Jagiełło, the country of Poland-Lithuania would rise to new prominence. There was a period in the late 15th and early 16th century when members of the Jagiellonian dynasty ruled over Poland, Lithuania, Bohemia, and Hungary simultaneously, a period I call the Jagiellonian moment. As part of the Christian West, the inhabitants of Poland, Lithuania, participated actively in the cultural efflorescence that was the Renaissance. A look at the gold dome Zygmunt Chapel on the Wawel Cathedral or the Wawel Castle's arcaded courtyard suggests as much. Less visible to us today, for who studies Latin anymore, is the literary output of the age. That said, this golden age in Poland-Lithuania also witnessed the literary debut of the Polish language, prose and poetry alike. As one proud Pole famously acclaimed, Poles are not geese, they have their own language. The language of the 16th century remains intelligible today. But as was true with many a royal family, siring sons to carry on could be a problem. In the mid 16th century, the Jagiellonian dynasty was on the verge of extinction. The king, Zygmunt August, came up with a novel plan 
what had been a personal union between Poland and Lithuania was transformed into a real one. This was the so-called Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Not your regular monarchy, it was a republic consisting of two halves, Polish and Lithuanian. The Commonwealth furthermore became an elective monarchy in which every nobleman had the right to vote for the king. Over the next two centuries, those elected Polish kings came from France and Hungary, Sweden and Saxony, as well as from within Poland itself. The composition, a competition rather, to control this large territory was fierce and tales of the elections are quite colorful. One of the more noteworthy kings was the Transylvanian Stefan Batory, who married the last Jagiellon sister and set out regaining control over some borderland territories that had been lost to Russia. Yet this was not the only incursion into Russia. Under Batory's successor, King Zygmunt III of the Swedish Vasa branch of the Jagiellons, Poles got all the way to Moscow. This put Poles in the same league with Napoleon and Hitler, although neither of them managed to occupy the Russian capital for an entire year, as did the Poles. King Zygmunt's son was even offered the Russian throne if he converted to Russian orthodoxy, but he didn't. So that brought the escapade to an end. Worth underscoring is that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a state unique in Europe of that period. At a time when other countries fought religious wars and became increasingly autocratic, the people we call Poles were trailblazers of tolerance and defenders of diversity. In the 16th century, which has been called Poland's golden age, the country was a bastion of religious tolerance. It was hardly the religiously homogeneous, predominantly Roman Catholic state of today, the country of Pope John Paul II. Back then, there was a substantial Eastern Orthodox population in the Eastern or Lithuanian half of the country, lands we now associate with Belarus and Ukraine. There were also many Jews who over the centuries had been given rights and privileges by the Polish kings and were allowed to have their own parliament, making Poland a magnet for Jews un under persecution elsewhere in Europe. Tatars of Muslim faith also could be found in the country, and their descendants are in Poland to this day. Poland-Lithuania turned out to be the first country to recognize a Protestant state. This was Lutheran Prussia, which at the time became a fief of the Polish crown. Protestantism also made inroads in Poland-Lithuania, especially among the nobles. King Zygmunt August, the last of the Jagiellons, famously declared that he was not king of their consciences. Following the king's death, legislation was passed that enshrined religious toleration in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This 25 years before the French Edict of Nantes. During Europe's religious wars, religious dissenters who were being persecuted elsewhere flooded into the tolerant Commonwealth. One could say that this permutation of Poland looked and felt significantly different from the rest of the continent in this period. Indeed, the country's espousal of the idea of unity in diversity made it a better precursor to the European Union of today than Western Europe. 
the Poles century long preoccupation with freedom, their insistence that power resides in the nation or people, not the king, made the country look less like the rest of monarchical Europe and more like the United States. So who were these people and what made them Poles? As I suggested at the beginning of my lecture, this question is hardly moot. Who was considered a Pole varied over the course of Polish history? Poland's most creative pre-modern incarnation as a state, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was multi-ethnic and multi-denominational. The Poles of the Commonwealth were not always ethnic Poles, Roman Catholics, or native speakers of Polish, the way we tend to define the nation in modern times. The noble nation of the early modern period extended the full rights of citizenship to nobles across the breadth and length of this state and of different ethnic backgrounds. Among the country's inhabitants were people whom today we would call Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Germans, Jews, Armenians, Tatars, among others. Those of noble birth were considered part of the Polish nation, by which I mean the citizens who elected the king, defended the country and owned land. The mightiest of these held high offices and owned dozens of towns and hundreds of villages, while the poorest among them lived for all practical purpose like the peasants. The nobles attributed their exalted status in the country to an imagined Sarmatian heritage that set them off from the rest of the population. That said, Although there were powerful noblemen known as magnates, a Polish saying had it that all nobles were equal. A number of other groups within the country, and here one should mention Germans, Jews, Armenians, and so on, were primarily townspeople, that is urban dwellers, many of them traders and artisans. Some also became clergymen, as in the case of the country's most famous priest before Pope John Paul II. This would be the Renaissance man, Nicolaus Copernicus. Copernicus developed his heliocentric views while working for and even defending Poland Lithuania. But the largest segment of the population, some 80%, were peasants, that is village folk who labored in the fields. They spoke dialects of any of a number of languages that today we would call Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, or German. The vast majority of the peasants were serfs. That is, they were tied to the land owned by the nobility or the church. Worth noting, their descendants make up the bulk of today's Poles and many a Polish American as well. Serfs were an important source of manpower in an age when the grain trade was the source of Polish wealth. Here, let's consider what made the Commonwealth rich. Trade routes had long crisscrossed the country, bringing in merchants from near and far. Polish nobles shipped their grain and other goods down the Vistula and other rivers to their Baltic Sea destination. The main port was Gdańsk, which with a population of 50,000 in the year 1600, was the biggest, certainly the most populous city in the Commonwealth. The river trade enabled burghers to prosper and nobles to become incredibly wealthy. Since the nobles' estates were essentially self-sufficient, their earnings from the grain trade could be and were spent on luxury goods. With its distinctiveness, its size, its wealth, 
the Commonwealth proved a tantalizing target for those on its margins. In this way, Poland's central location, which one historian famously termed the heart of Europe, has been both a blessing and a curse. Indeed, Poles have often been victims of their own unenviable geography. As of the mid 17th century, the Commonwealth proved to be a crossroads, literally, as well as figuratively. Things got so bad that the period has gone down in history as the deluge. This was a time of civil war. Under the leadership of the Cossacks, Orthodox Christians in the southeast of the country rose up and fought, ultimately seceding from the Commonwealth. With this secession, the people whom we would now call Ukrainians came into the Russian orbit. But little belligerent Sweden also invaded mid-century, as did Russia. The invaders absconded with all manner of plunder from the Commonwealth's churches and castles. I won't go into greater detail here, except to add that these wars of the mid 17th century have been described in thrilling, swashbuckling fashion by the 19th century Polish historical novelist Henryk Sienkiewicz, Poland's first Nobel laureate in literature. While the country rebounded from that debacle, a turning point in the war was the repelling of the Swedes at Częstochowa, the site of Poland's most famous miraculous image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was never quite the same. There still were high points, such as the defeat of the Turks at the gates of Vienna in 1683 under the leadership of the Polish King Jan Sobieski, who saved the capital of the Holy Roman Empire from the Turkish menace. That said, the country found new low points under two Saxon kings, August II and August III of the Wettin dynasty. Under the first August, the Commonwealth once more was overrun by its belligerent neighbors. Under the second August, it stagnated, if in peacetime. Relieved that hostilities had ceased, nobles retreated to their estates and comfortable lives. Their republicanism during this so-called Saxon night became xenophobic and megalomanic. To make matters worse, while the nobility made much of its historic golden freedoms, the country was under pressure from its neighbors, Russia in particular. Now, this was the period when enlightened ideas percolated throughout Europe, the Commonwealth included. Some Poles saw the need for reform for the freedom-loving, if somewhat anarchic, republic was surrounded by enlightened despotism personified by the three rapacious monarchs who ruled the neighboring countries. These were Frederick the Great, ruler of an up-and-coming Prussia, Maria Theresa, ruler of Austria, and Catherine the Great of Russia. They opportunistically annexed pieces of the Commonwealth in what have gone down in history as the partitions of Poland. The annexations took place in three stages, 1772, 1793, and 1795. How, you may wonder, did it come to be that this largest country in continental Europe was wiped off the map of Europe. An armed uprising against Russian interference in the affairs of the Commonwealth in the years 1768 to 1772 gave the country's neighbors a pretext to secure their borders, occupying and ultimately annexing pieces of the country in the process. This was the first partition in 1772. 
Stunned at first, Polish reformers, including the enlightened King Stanisław August Poniatowski, ultimately reacted with a bold move, a plan of reform that included Europe's first constitution, the constitution of May 3rd, 1791. Celebrated to this day, the Polish constitution was the second in the world after the United States won. The thought that Poland might rebound stronger than before proved threatening to the partitioning powers who sliced off additional pieces of Poland in the second partition of 1793. Not even an insurrection led by Tadeusz Kościuszko, a hero of the American War of Independence could save what was left of Poland. What remained of the country was partitioned out of existence in 1795, with the partitioning powers later secretly vowing never to use the name Poland again. Now, having just learned about the partitions, a student of mine once asked, why don't we just stop the class here? for the Polish state ceased to exist in 1795. But we don't. The 19th century is a fascinating example of how, even when it lacked independent statehood, the nation, by which I mean the national community of Poles, did not cease to exist, but rather persisted against all odds. Many Poles went the route of revolt, fighting to regain and reunite their country. They joined the Napoleonic charge across Europe and even were granted a small Napoleonic puppet state, the Duchy of Warsaw, for several years. After 1815's Congress of Vienna, an even smaller kingdom of Poland was attached to the Russian Empire with the Russian czar serving as Poland's king. Poles there chafed under Russian rule against which they rose up twice in 1830 and 1863. A famous battle slogan was, for our freedom and for yours. Poles sensitive to the plight of other downtrodden peoples as well. There were other attempts at insurrection in the partitioned lands. I won't go into the details here. What is important to note is that nearly each post-partition generation took up arms. Poles in exile, individuals such as the composer Frederick Chopin and poet Adam Mickiewicz also did what they could to keep the memory of Poland alive. Towards the end of the century, Poles also worked at the foundations, seeking to raise up the peasants, now emancipated, no longer serfs, and turn them into nationally conscious Poles. Prior to then, peasants had considered Poles to be nobles, their noble oppressors, and saw themselves as a distinct people. No longer just for the nobles, the nation became more inclusive in certain ways during the century in which there was no independent Polish state, accepting into its ranks those from outside the nobility, townspeople and peasants both. Their modern day descendants have been taught Polish history and most are hardly cognizant that their ancestors may have had a different attitude towards being Polish. Things eventually looked best under Austrian rule, where by the late 19th century, Poles gained a degree of autonomy in political rights. At the turn of the century, a new generation of politicians, such as Roman Domowski, and even more so, Józef Piłsudski, started to make preparations for a Polish future. Piłsudski was prescient. World War, he rightly surmised, would provide the nation with an opportunity to achieve independence. 
Piłsudski established Polish legions under Austrian aegis. He bet, correctly as it turns out, that Tsarist Russia would fall first, and then the central powers of Austria, Hungary, and Germany would be defeated by the West. During World War I, Poles such as Domowski and world-renowned pianist Ignacy Jan Paderewski lobbied the Western powers for support. And indeed, during the course of the war, US President Woodrow Wilson called for the establishment of a Polish state with access to the sea in his famous 14 points. After the war ended, an independent Polish state was established, the so-called Second Polish Republic. Not that independent existence came easily. Poland's actual borders were determined in the course of further wars on nearly all fronts. The most serious of these was the Polish-Soviet War of 1920. The Poles miraculously repelled the Soviet forces that were approaching Warsaw, in this way saving the West from the Soviet onslaught, for the Bolsheviks wanted to turn all of Europe red. An event of world historical significance, the Polish victory over Bolshevik Russia in 1920 kept communism at bay. What ensued was a so-called interwar period. Over the next 20 years, Poles would work to turn what for over a century had been three distinct partition zones, Russian, German, Austrian, into a coherent state. Railroad networks needed to be connected and railway gauges standardized. Yet the state's borders did not reflect either the nationalist vision of a purely Polish ethnic Catholic Poland, nor Piłsudski's plan for an East Central European Federation. A full one third of the population was not ethnolinguistically Polish. This proved challenging for the young state, which more represented a mini empire than pure nation state. For over the course of the long 19th century, various groups within the former Commonwealth had come to think of themselves in distinct national terms, be they Lithuanians or Ukrainians, Germans or Jews. A major setback was the assassination of Poland's first elected president, Gabriel Narutowicz, by a rabid nationalist. This did not bode well for state inclusiveness. Roman Domowski's nationalists saw no room for those other than ethnic Poles in the country, let alone the government. Yet after the coup d'etat of Marshal Józef Piłsudski in May 1926, the situation stabilized. There were noteworthy achievements uh, in the interwar period. The port of Gdynia was built. The country initiated a big industrial push. Polish culture was thriving. Of course, the Great Depression made things more difficult. After Piłsudski's death in 1935, the colonels who came to rule the country became more nationalistic and exclusionary. Discrimination against the country's minorities proceeded apace. It was but a question of time until Poland's unenviable geopolitical situation was keenly felt once again. Which brings us to World War II. On September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland. The Soviet Union followed suit 16 days later. Poland's Western allies did not respond as expected. The Poles fought alone valiantly before capitulating. Poles managed to form a government in exile and a number of Poles ultimately ended up fighting as part of the Allied forces 
distinguishing themselves at places such as Monte Cassino and even serving as fighter pilots with the British. An extensive Polish underground known as the Home Army or Armia Krajowa mobilized Poles back home. And much of what had been home was turned into the Nazi controlled General Gouvernement. Numerous Poles in the Eastern lands annexed by the Soviet Union were either exiled to the Soviet interior or killed outright. The fate of nearly 22,000 POWs at Katyn and other sites. After the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany, the annihilation of the Jews began. The General Gouvernement was where most concentration and extermination camps were located, although Auschwitz, a symbol for many of the Holocaust, had been annexed to Germany proper. Opposition to Nazi German rule had its costs. In desperate straits, what remained of Warsaw's Jewish population rose up in 1943 in the ghetto, only to perish at the end. The Germans razed the area of the ghetto. The Warsaw Uprising of 1944 was fought by the Home Army against the Nazi German forces. The Red Army, which by then had made its way to the outskirts of Warsaw, stood by and watched the Nazis destroy the Polish capital. The Poland that rose from the ashes of World War II was literally a different country. Poland was transformed physically, socially, ideologically. The borders of the country were shifted westward. Population transfers and ethnic cleansing erased what remained of the multi-ethnic nature of previous incarnations of Poland. If there was ever a state that was composed of ethnic Poles, the Polish People's Republic was it. The multi-ethnic legacy was obliterated. Witnessing a degree of upward mobility, many former peasants were transformed into workers. The country was pulled into the Eastern Soviet orbit, where it remained until 1989. Those here old enough to remember the communist era may recall that Poles had their periods of resistance. Simple mention of the years 1956, 1968, 1970, 1976 calls to mind Polish insubordination and dissatisfaction, Polish protests. The election of a Pole to the papacy seemed to embolden Pope John Paul II's Polish brethren. 1980 marked the birth of the free and self-governing trade unions known as Solidarity, a movement subsequently crushed by martial law in December 1981. Yet towards the end of the decade, Poland was the first country of the Soviet bloc to begin the breakaway with a round table followed by semi-free elections in June 1989. Then the rest of the bloc tumbled like dominoes. Poles can be proud of that achievement, although there are some who argue that a sharper break with the communist past should have been made. Yet this was the price of being a trailblazer. Not that the transition from state socialism or communism came easy. The country underwent the pains of shock therapy designed to put Poland on better economic footing. Instituting liberal democracy went more smoothly, although recently the country has taken a more populist authoritarian turn. Sound familiar? <laughs> 
Poland was admitted to NATO in 1999, to the European Union in 2004. Thus, it is very much a part of a broader West, a united Europe. Poland long seemed to be the poster boy for success in the former Eastern Europe. Yet, in recent years, things have changed. The present Polish government, led by the Law and Justice Party, in power since 2015, has charted a divergent, distinctly illiberal course of its own. Poland, much like the United States, is fractured. Part of the population demands that rights be respected and the government adhere to the Polish constitution, protesting whenever the government violates any of these. By contrast, those in power claiming to speak for or even define the nation seek to create by whatever means necessary a different, more insular, less tolerant, ethnographic and ethnolinguistic Poland only for Polish Catholics. This at a time when immigration into Poland has been rising. Only time will tell which way the Polish pendulum will swing. I hope you found this brief introduction to Polish history informative. Poland is unquestionably a full-fledged part of Europe and a part of European and even world history worth knowing about. We historians find Poland to be a splendid case study for exploring major themes of European and global history. It was a place where Christianization, the Enlightenment, nationalization, and modernization proceeded in interesting and sometimes unexpected ways. One can likewise argue for the country's centrality in the 20th century as the site where various ideologies vied for influence. Even today, Poland proves a worthy and fascinating subject of study. I hope this lecture will encourage you to learn more. And thank you for your attention. Fantastic. I learned an immense amount there. We have just a few questions in the chat. So somebody wants to know if there were any Polish queens. Oh, but of course. Although I will tell you, uh, the Polish queen Jadwiga was actually called a king because of the fact that there was no provision made for, for labeling someone a queen. So she was the one who as a young girl of uh, a, a barely a teenager became king of Poland at the time. This is uh, uh, in the uh, late medieval period. Okay, somebody else wants to know if it's clear in the Polish language, how different ethnic populations change the language. Oh, that's a great question. In the Polish language, hmm. Well, I'm sure there are influences across the, the board with terminology. Uh, one thing one can think of is when I was talking earlier about um, uh, the influx of Czechs and Germans into the Polish lands very early on, much of the terminology that is uh, urban terminology uh, is taken from the German or Czech. So yes, indeed, there, there, are, there are plenty of borrowings that way. So probably when they came in to move into the area of Poland affected which part of language it affected. Mm -hmm. For example, take the, the term uh, for, for a town hall, ratus in Poland, rathaus in German. So you see they're very similar. That makes sense. And somebody wants to know a little bit about Galicia and who lived there in that part of Poland. Oh, well, Galicia is a fascinating bit of Polish history. Again, this is the Austrian uh, zone of partition that uh, most of which came into uh, Austrian control in 1772. 
within that broad southern region that has the Carpathian Mountains in it, you have Poles, Jews, and Ruthenians or Ukrainians, however you prefer to use the terminology, depending on, on, the, on the time. So those would be the, the major populations. You also had uh, uh, Armenians in the east of that region as well. And I'm sure there's other smaller groups of people whom I'm forgetting, but those were the three main populations of Galicia. And then the last question asked more about the Sarmatians. Ah, well, Sarmatian or Sarmatianism is this um, invented theory, if you would, of, of, of national origin for the Polish nobility. Now, Sarmatians came from over in, uh, from over in Asia, and this is a a population I think that lived there in something like the third century or whatever. I'm a little fuzzy on those beginnings, but it became a, a very useful fiction for the Polish nobility uh, to, to think that it had a common origin. Remember when I was talking about the nobility that uh, nobles of all different backgrounds were considered to be Poles. So you could be um, uh, Lithuanian speaking, you could be Ukrainian speaking, you could be German speaking and, and still be considered uh, of the Polish nation. And so that uh, the whole idea of, of, of the Sarmatian ideology was, was extremely important for national unity at a time when other countries were uh, essentially fighting wars of religion and so on. Great. And then one more question came in about the term Ruthenian, and they want to know, well, they say, can you explain where does the term Ruthenian come from and how is it related to Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the term Ruthenian comes from the term for Rus, which is talking about the origins of uh, this, uh, of the people we call Ruthenians, it, going back to the times of Kievan Rus in the late um, 10th century. Uh, so they, they, these, this was Rus, and these were called Ruthenes or Ruthenians. Uh, only later do we start speaking of them as Ukrainians, but that would be the term that most people would identify them with now. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered the full question there. Um, I think they just wanted to know how it was related to Ukraine. So yes. I so, think that answers them. Uh -huh. Well, because essentially in the 19th century, the Ukrainian national movement began, and that was very active in Galicia that I was talking about earlier. And uh, eventually the people who had been called Ruthenian until that time started wanting to be called Ukrainian instead. Great. So I learned an immense amount. Um, I'm always disappointed when a country ends up being squashed and changed and borders moved and it just can just make it so disappointing for people who don't know where they're from anymore well um, polish history is is complicated yeah. but i think it's fascinating and again you have so many different dimensions to it high points and low points and we all hope for the best for the country now certainly so I appreciate so much that you came and spoke to us about the history of Poland. I can't believe you can do it in such a short time because there's so much in there. Um, so I'm it's looking very hard to, to condense, I will tell yes. you, but uh, I did my best. Yeah, and there was one last question about the Jews in Poland and their autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, well, the Jews were given a, a sort of parliament of allowed to form a parliament of their own, if you would, a sort of self-government that was there was there was one such parliament for the Polish lands and one such parliament for the Lithuanian lands. And so this was a frankly a, a very good situation for Jews at a time when elsewhere in Europe they're being persecuted. So you actually have people calling um the Polish lands paradise for the Jews at a certain point in time. 
Yeah, it seemed like they were very welcoming at one, <laughs> one Certainly point. Certainly at one point, yes. yes. Well, they, the, the Jews also com, uh, contributed a lot to the economy. So that's, that's also, they, they had a the very important function within yes. society. All right. Um, I think that's all the questions. Do you have any last words you want to leave with people? Uh, well, I just hope that you will continue to study Polish history and follow what's going on today because uh, things keep changing in Poland and it's sort of, there's, there's never a dull moment when you're studying Polish history. Fabulous, thank you for speaking to us and we hope we get to hear from you again. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for the questions. All right, good night, everyone. And all right, I'm going to end the session now. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.